It's raining. Yay. Yay. About a year ago when we came, uh, it rained for like two weeks straight. And people said, you brought the rain with you from Pennsylvania. And one day we came, it was Sunday morning, and it was raining outside. And I was kind of like gloomy, like, oh, the weather's bad outside. Joanna's laughing because she knows what's coming. And she goes, that's good here. You know, that's not a downer. So Joanna, being the one that likes to correct me all the time, she uh, said, no, you don't want to be gloomy when it's raining here. So <laughs> praise God for rain. So uh, good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the dads here. And if you have your Bibles, please open them to the book of Psalms. Today we're going to look at Psalm 117. That's where we're going to be eventually. But uh, before we kick off this summer in the Psalms, I think it would be appropriate for me to give you some background information on the Psalms. You know, you would think we would do a Father's Day message, but we didn't do a Mother's Day message, so it wouldn't go well if we did that. And let me just say, I'm really excited to be in this book for the coming months ahead in the Psalms. I love the Psalms, and, and I'm hoping that this will be a blessing to us, this study. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to be in the Old Testament for the summer and to dig into this wonderful, wonderful book. Where the word psalm means a composition that is set to music. Uh, the psalms, we might say, are lyrical, liber, excuse me, lyrical poetry. And though we know this book as the book of psalms, it's actually a book that is made up of, of five books that was compiled with five books over a span of many centuries. And it was probably finalized in the 4th century B.C. And so to give you an idea, book 1 is Psalms 1 through 41. Book 2 is Psalm 42 through 72. Book 3 is Psalm 73 to 89. Book 4 is Psalm 90 to 106. And book 5 is Psalm 107 to 150. And, and the Psalms, when they come to authorship, have a variety of authors, with the main author being David, to whom 73 Psalms are attributed. But other authors in the book of Psalms are um, uh, Asaph, Solomon, Moses, and then others, with 50 authors, 50 Psalms being anonymous, which means that we don't know exactly who wrote those Psalms. The Psalms, uh, you might want to know, are not organized in a strict chronological order. Uh, in other words, Psalm 1 is not the first Psalm that was written. It was actually Psalm 90. And we know that because the author of Psalm 90 is Moses. Moses is the one who wrote Psalm 90. Now, within the book of Psalms, we find different types of Psalms. And though these distinctions are going to vary depending on who you ask. And as we go through the Psalms this summer, we're not going to go through all 150 of them, but we'll go through a few. I'm going to mention what type of Psalm we're looking at and what that means. But to give you an idea this morning of some of the types of Psalms that there are, I want to give you a few of those here. There are Psalms of praise which focus on praising God. Although I would argue that every single psalm, in one sense, is a psalm of praise, because every psalm uh, encourages us to praise and to worship God. There are psalms of penitence, which are psalms of repentance, where the author is expressing a repentant heart to God and seeking forgiveness from his sins. There are royal psalms, which focus on, on the king and his role. There are psalms of thanksgiving, which focus on thanking God for His works and His actions in this world. And there are also what are called psalms, which are imprecatory psalms, which call judgment down upon the enemies of God. And I want to look at at least one of those this summer, because I want to answer how does that square off with God's command to love our enemies and to pray for our enemies. How is it that some of the psalms, we find the psalmist praying judgment down upon the enemies of God? And so we want to look at at least one of those this summer. But now what do we 
learn in the Psalms? What do the Psalms teach us? The Psalms teach us much about the attributes of God. The Psalms teach us much about the various names of God. They teach us about the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. They teach us about the promises of God to His people. And in the Psalms, we learn much about human emotion and situations of life that people have to endure. One commentator, Graham Scroge, says this of the Psalms, quote, Multitudes in all ages have resorted to these ancient poems and have derived therefrom cheer for their tasks, strength for their burdens, courage for their battles, comfort for their sorrows, light for their journey, and hope for their ventures. And this is perhaps why so many New Testament-only Bibles also include the Psalms and the Proverbs, because this book speaks to human emotion. Uh, this connects with us, and, and we, we see here the various struggles that people face in life, and they tell us about this God who is working in the lives of his people in the midst of these struggles. And so we connect with this book. And in addition to that, it may be because this is the most quoted book in the New Testament, the book of Psalms. So there's a wealth of spiritual truth in this book. And I, and I pray that throughout these coming months, it will be a blessing to us as we mine these treasures. And this is maybe why Charles Spurgeon named his commentary on the Psalms the treasury of David. Because there is treasure in this book. Spiritual treasure. So as I, as I said this morning, earlier on, when we began, it's still morning, we're going to be in Psalm 117, which is a psalm of praise. Praising God. And I want to go ahead and, and read this psalm, Psalm 117. And the title for this sermon, for this psalm, is simply this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if you want to know how to spell that, it's H-A-L-L-E-L-U-J-A-H. I didn't know, so I had to look it up. Let's go ahead and read this extremely long psalm this morning. We're going to, look, we're going to go through the whole thing this morning, so I hope, I hope you're awake. Psalm 117, a psalm of praise. Verse 1, praise the Lord all nations, laud him, all peoples, for his loving kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. This is the shortest psalm in the Psalter. This is the smallest chapter in the Bible, and this is the dead center of divine revelation. This is the middle chapter in the entire Bible. And though small in size, it packs a weight of truth that is disproportionate to its size because God can communicate great truths in few words. This psalm is part of a collection of psalms referred to as the Egyptian Hallel. The word Hallel means praise in Hebrew. And the Egyptian Hallel spans from Psalm 113 to 118. The Egyptian Hallels are psalms that were sung in celebration of Israel's deliverance from Egypt. And so commentators believe that Psalm 113 and 114 were sung before the uh, meal of the Passover, and Psalms 115 through 118 were sung after the Passover meal. And so this psalm, as we see here, has a very simple structure. We're starting with the simple this morning. In verse 1, we find a call to praise. In verse 2, we find the reason for praise in lines 1 and 2 of verse 2. And then in the final line of verse 2, line 3, there's a renewed call to praise. And so praise the Lord, two reasons why we praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Look at line one. This is the praise of the one true God. The psalmist says, Praise the Lord, all 
nations. This begins with a call to praise, to, to a summons to, to worship God, to ascribe worth to God, to ascribe the honor that is due to Him, God, the Lord, that is Yahweh, the I Am. And, and that's the name for God that we find in this verse. And that is important because that is the name that God gave to Moses to give to Israel in Exodus 3.14 where it says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he says, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am, Yahweh has sent me to you. And so this is the personal name of God that was given to Israel. And yet what is striking here is that in this shortest psalm, in this smallest chapter in the Bible, in the very center of divine revelation, not only Israel, but all nations are called to praise Yahweh, the God of Israel. And so this is looking forward to a time when all nations, all Gentiles, would praise the same God, the God of Israel, the only God of the universe. And it stresses the reality that although the, the worship and praise of the one true God in this world began in Israel, it did not end there. It began there. It was always God's plan that all nations of the world would be blessed through whom? Abraham, who is the patriarch of Israel. And that through Abraham, all nations would come to worship the same God. One commentator points out that this is a truth that the Jews in Jesus' day had forgotten as they thought that they were the sole recipients of God's grace. But no, it was always God's plan that all nations would worship Him. In Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, the Lord comes to Abraham, and He says to Abraham, at the time Abram, Go forth from your country, and from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, <clears throat> I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth, all nations, will be blessed. In other words, we could say that this psalm is messianic in nature, looking forward to a time when all nations would worship the same God through the same Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is how the Apostle Paul viewed this psalm as he quotes it in Romans 15 and verse 11. But I want to read to you Romans 15, verses 8 through 11. The Apostle Paul says, For I say that Christ, Jesus, has become a servant to the circumcision, that is Israel, Jews, and on behalf of the truth of God, to confirm the promises given to the fathers, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. Again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, and here's our verse this morning, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the nations, all the peoples, praise him. This is how the Apostle Paul viewed the fulfillment of this verse. All other gods are false gods. There's only one true God, the Lord Yahweh. He's the only object that is worthy of worship in this world. All other gods are idols. He alone deserves praise and thanksgiving. Well, then look at what the psalmist says in verse 2. He repeats, Laud him all peoples. In Hebrew poetry, which is what the Psalms are, there, there is what's called parallelism, okay? Where line two of a verse in some way complements line one of the verse, okay? And so here what we find is synonymous parallelism. Synonymous parallelism, where the inspired author restates line one in line two with different words. In other words, he repeats himself using different words. And so in line one, he says, praise the Lord, all nations. And then he says the same thing in line two, laud him, all peoples. 
In the NASB, the, the word Lord means to praise, to extol. And so this, this is further emphasizing, reinforcing the all-encompassing nature of this call to praise Yahweh. Those of us here this morning, we're gathered on Sunday morning. We have entered into a covenant relationship with God. Those of us who have trusted Christ. And so every time we meet, every time we meet on, on Sunday mornings and any other time, we are fulfilling this verse. We are fulfilling this verse. We are all praising the Lord, Yahweh. As the gospel spreads to all nations, this is being fulfilled as all peoples are coming into covenant relationship with God. All nations are praising Yahweh. And Psalm 86, 9 is being fulfilled where it says, All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and they shall glorify your name. And this, of course, will have its ultimate fulfillment when all nations, every tribe and tongue and nation is worshiping God before the throne in heaven. In the meanwhile, we are to praise the Lord here on earth. But why? What's the reason for praising God that we're given here? What, 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 is the, what, is, what fuels our worship on earth? Why worship Yahweh and not idols? Why worship the Lord and not something else? It's not legalism. It's not because we have to. Look what he says in, in verse 2. Here are the two reasons why we praise God the unfailing love of God for His people, and the unending faithfulness of God for His people. The psalmist says, For His loving kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Amen. So we're giving two, re two reasons here to praise God. The first is the greatness of God's loving kindness toward His people. Now the word loving kindness here is more than just God's kindness. This word refers to his unfailing love, to his steadfast love, which he has toward his covenant people. As the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary says, this is the Old Testament's highest expression for love. It is variously called God's election, covenant-keeping, or steadfast love. It is a love that remains constant regardless of the circumstances in our lives. This is the sort of love that God has for His people. It is a love that is unbroken. It doesn't fluctuate in response to the situations in our lives. His loving kindness is great toward you, believer. It is great toward me. And notice the present tense. Not was, not will be, but is. His loving kindness is great toward you. And the word great in the Hebrew can be translated mighty or strong. It cannot be broken. And this verse in the Hebrew literally reads, For His loving kindness prevails upon us. It floods us. Spurgeon said of, of this verse, as only Spurgeon could say, the mighty grace of God has prevailed even as the waters of the flood prevailed over the earth. Breaking over all bounds, it has flowed towards all portions of the multiplied race of man. In Christ Jesus, God has shown mercy mixed with kindness, and that to the very highest degree. You and I, we, we cannot escape this love. It would be easier for us, as God's people, to travel to the very edge of the universe than to escape the love of God. Psalm 103, 11 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His loving kindness toward those who fear Him. And so this is the love of God that saved us, and this is the love of God that's going to keep us to the end, that will see us through to the end. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans 8, 37-39. I think we all know this, these verses. 
But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What grounds for assurance we have here. And this is why when, when we sin as believers, and we do sin as believers, we must appeal to the loving kindness of God, to His undying love for us. As the psalmist did in Psalm 51 and verse 1, David, this is the penitential psalm. He cries out, Be, be gracious to me, O God, According to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. As, as sinners lost in our sins, as one commentator put it, we can't appeal to the justice of God. Because if we appeal to justice, we would all perish. Because we have all broken God's law. And so what do we appeal to? We appeal to His loving kindness, to His grace, to His mercy, to His compassion. But even as believers, we, we need to appeal to His loving kindness, which extends grace and forgiveness to us when we confess our sins. As it says in 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What an amazing promise we have in Scripture. And so we praise the Lord, whose, whose love is undying toward us. It will never be quenched. Regardless of the circumstances in your life, regardless of how strong you are in your faith or how weak you are in your doubts, God's love for you does not end. It is undying. When we feel far from God, His love does not depart from us. And Scripture says He has loved you with an everlasting love. And Jesus says, I am with you always even to the end of the age. And so his love inspires worship. But the second reason we find in verse 2, in line 2, is the reason that his faithfulness endures forever. His faithfulness endures forever. The psalmist says, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. And this refers to the faithfulness of God. That just as his love is immense toward us, his faithfulness endures to the end. And so both of these attributes work hand in hand. His, his loving kindness and His faithfulness. As with a husband who loves his wife with undying love, that's going to lead him to be faithful to his covenant to her in marriage. To love her, to protect her, to provide, to remain for better or for worse until death do us part. How much more true is that of God with us? How much more true is that of Jesus Christ with His bride? This is true, except, except it is till death bring us into His immediate presence. Because to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. And so for the saint, death is a welcome friend. It brings us to Christ. And we'll be with Him forever. So here's the grounds, again, for assurance that God will keep His promises to us. He will keep His promises to us. He cannot lie. He does not change. There is not a shifting shadow in God. He is faithful to the end. Unlike us, He is faithful to the end. We waver in our faith. We doubt. We struggle. We fail. God doesn't fail. He is faithful. Thank God that He is not like us. And this is not the, is this not the testimony of Scripture 
when we look at the Bible, of a faithful God who over and over again in his dealings with his saints is faithful to keep his promises even when his people waver. He was faithful to Abraham to give him Isaac through Sarah even when he wavered and had, and had Ishmael with Hagar. He was faithful to David to give him the throne even the, with all of David's mistakes and failures. And on and on and on we could go and find no instance in which God has failed to keep His promises to His covenant people. Psalm 100 and verse 5 says it well. It says, For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And His faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 33 verse 4 says, For the word of the Lord is upright, and all His work is done in faithfulness. In Psalm 146 and verse 6, God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. How can you be sure that you'll stand in the end? How, how can you be sure that you'll be spotless before a holy God? That you'll be received? That you won't be rejected? Because this is true. He's faithful. He's faithful. Listen to Hebrews 2:16 through 18. It says, "For assuredly he, that is Jesus, does not give help to angels. He gives help to the descendants of Abraham. And therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So we have a, a faithful high priest in heaven. Christ's work for us is, is ongoing in heaven as he sits at the right hand of God. He ever lives to intercede for his people. It is he who died and who rose again on our behalf to redeem us from sin and death and wrath. He will not allow those who are his, descendants of Abraham by faith, that is, us of, who have trusted in Christ, to, to perish in the end. And we have to believe that. We have to hold on to this truth. That he is faithful. He does not waver, does not tire, does not change. This is why the psalmists and other people in Scripture say that God is our rock. He's our rock. He does not change. He's our refuge. He's our fortress. He's our help. He's our salvation. He's our anchor. And therefore, His people, we praise Him, the Lord. The faithfulness of God inspires worship. The loving kindness of God inspires worship. But then look how he ends the psalm. The psalmist gives a, a renewed call to praise. Two bookends. Two calls to praise, and in the middle, two reasons to praise. The psalmist says, praise the Lord. Literally in the Hebrew, this is the word hallelujah. Hallel to praise. Ooh, yah. Yahweh. Praise the Lord. So you may be visiting here with us this morning. Uh, you may be here and you don't know why it is that we worship the Lord, why we praise the Lord. Uh, what's all this worship about? Why do we meet on Sunday mornings? It's not legalism. It's not because we have to. It is because we worship a God who has redeemed us. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's whom you worship. Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is the I Am. Jesus is God. He said, before Abraham was, I Am. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. 
So we worship Him because of what He's done for us. He has redeemed us. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Him, He needs to redeem you. You need to be redeemed because you have sinned against this God who is holy and just. You have broken His law in your thoughts, in your words, in your deeds, just as we all have. Scripture says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You have to be saved if you are to go to heaven. Because God is holy and just. He must punish sin. He must punish you because He is holy, because He is just. He cannot deny His justice. But as you heard this morning, He is also loving. The loving kindness of God. And His loving kindness extends grace and mercy and forgiveness of sins because of what Jesus Christ has done through His life and death and resurrection. Jesus is the sinless Son of God who bore the sins of His people on the cross. And He suffered the punishment in their place so that they might be set free from this, the consequences of sin, which, which is God's wrath. Jesus suffered the wrath of God in the place of sinners as their substitute. He drank down the wrath of God that belongs to them. And He gives His perfect righteousness to those who repent of their sins and who trust in Him alone. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For He, God, made Him who never sinned, who knew no sin, that is Jesus, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. What is the proof that his sacrifice was enough to forgive our sins? His resurrection. As it says in Romans, he was raised because of our justification. And if you're here this morning, you need a total forgiveness of your sins if you're to go to heaven. And you need a perfect righteousness to stand before God. And you don't have that by your own good deeds, by your own works. You need the righteousness of Christ. And the promise of Scripture is that if you repent of your sins, you turn from your evil, you abandon your wickedness, and turn to Christ by faith in Him alone, trusting that He paid for the sin, trusting in His righteousness alone, in His work alone. The Scripture promise is that you will be saved. Not all of your sins will be forgiven you. He will wash away all of your iniquity because He's faithful to keep that promise to save. And so I say to you this morning, if you're here and you don't know Christ, that you would repent and believe this gospel, these good news, and you will be saved. In Titus 3 and verse 4 through 5, it says, But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So strongly consider where you're at with God this morning. You're not promised another day. Whatever you're living for right now for this world, it's not worth your soul. Your soul goes on into eternity. And so you need to make things right with God right now. And so you need to repent of your sins. Trust in Christ alone. And He promises if you repent and believe in Jesus, you will be saved. You will be saved. Because of what He has accomplished through His life and death and resurrection. Amen. If you would bow your heads, I want to read you the, the songs, uh, the, uh, the lyrics of a song, uh, which many of you know, and then I'll pray and we'll close. And, and the name of the song is, His Mercy is More. And I believe that this song really encapsulates the truth that we find in this psalm. It says, what love could remember
what life could remember. No wrongs we have done, omniscient, all-knowing. He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore, our sins they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam, the Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. We thank you for the salvation that you've accomplished for us through him. That you sent him to live a perfect life on our behalf, to die a death that we could not die, to pay for our sins, to wash us clean, to put away our iniquities once for all, and then to rise again victorious over sin and death on the third day. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your compassion. And I pray, God, that anyone here this morning who has not come to know you in this way, who is still living in their sin, living for this world that is dying away, that is passing away, that they would turn today to Christ Jesus for forgiveness for grace, for mercy. And so be saved and be given eternal life and a new heart to worship you, to praise you, and to live for you alone. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.